Kanye West is a genius. When he came out, a lot of people doubted him because he wasn't on that street shit. You know what I'm saying? He was on some real life shit, some uplifting shit. You know what I'm saying? And just speaking his mind. And what I liked about him, he was just different. He, didn't, he just did what he did. Welcome to VT Talks. My name is Unique, and today's guest is the Juice Man himself, Juicy J. Welcome. What's up? How you doing? I'm doing great. And For sure. before we get into like talking about your book and everything that's going on, uh, we gotta talk about your fit first because yes. I know this is really important to you. Yeah. Uh, for mental health awareness. Yes. So let's talk about the significance of your outfit. Oh uh, yeah, I, like you said, I wear this for um, uh, mental health. I'm an advocate for mental health awareness. Um, if you need some help, you know, there's a lot of numbers people can call. Um, I don't want to see, you know, I'm sick of hearing about these uh, school shootings and all these mass shootings. These people need help, you know what I'm saying? Um, I believe that, you know, it starts from the, their childhood, uh, how they end up today. And it's very important, man. I think we should have uh, mental health programs in, more, in schools. We should talk more about it. And we should reach out to people we feel that's in need, or even if you don't know, or if you just know somebody that's always quiet all the time and kind of weird, reach out to them. You know what I'm saying? I feel like we can make a change if we all, you know, figure some things out and try to uh, to work with this situation. So I know, like, when people think of like people that have mental health issues, this is the image they have. Is that why you decided to like go around showing that like not everyone that's struggling with this looks like this or is wearing stuff like this? Yeah, and just to, to get to grab attention as well. You know what I'm saying? So I could I could talk about it and uh, express it and stuff like that. And I talk about that in my book. You know what I'm saying? My book, uh, Chronicles of uh, the Juice Man. I talk about a lot of mental health issues and stuff that I went through, and me being on the phone. Or just being around different people, you know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say no names, but have told me they was, they was gonna kill themselves, and I had to try to talk them out of that. So it's very, very, very serious and very real. And uh, I just wanna be, I mean, I'm an advocate of it. And I wanna try to uh, join some organizations and uh, or whatever to try to help, you know what I'm saying? Help these people, man, you know what I'm saying? I feel like if we get them some help, a lot of these things will, won't be happening like they happen. It's gonna take a lot of work though, you know? And I'm, I'm willing to step up. I mean, people know me from what I'm doing, trippy and all that, but that, was, that you know, that, that's that's the party side of Juicy J. This is the realistic, serious, you know, help the community side of Juicy J. And I'm standing on that, you know what I'm saying? Real shit. Can't okay. cuss, right? Yeah, she can curse. <laughs> oh, okay, real shit. Yeah. <laughs> all right, pause. Daddy, you want to take it off the yeah. top? Yeah, could y'all hear me good? Mm -hmm. I want to make sure, you know what I'm saying? I don't want nobody to get no words twisted. All right, so you got this new book that's, Coming out, Chronicles yep. of Just Met. Why did you name it after your first solo album? It fits, you know, it's a story. It's a life, my life story, you know what I'm saying? It tells everything, it's, 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 and, you know, it's an inspirational book. And like from what I've seen so far, it touches on like a lot of different things. So before we get into it, um, I heard like a clip of like your audio and, you, and you're telling a story and you're just talking about Memphis the city. Yes. So let's, let's talk about how Memphis not only influenced you as an artist, but like you individually and growing up in that atmosphere of the city. Memphis uh, taught me how to be strong, be a hustler, you know what I'm saying? Uh, overcome fear, everything, you know. It, it, you living in Memphis, they're gonna, they gonna turn you into a goon, you know what I mean? Because they're gonna, if you don't, if you ain't on goon time, you know, you, you're not on no, time, no type of time, you know what I'm saying? You need to get out of Memphis. Everybody's on goon time, you know what I'm saying? But it, it taught me how to, how to be a, a true hustler and just and just keep grinding as well. Not just not just you know running the streets and trying to relive some live some street life, you know, because that ain't what I that ain't what I'm all about. That, that ain't what I um, you know I did a little bit, there, but that wasn't my goal. My goal was wasn't trying to, to try to keep selling drugs or you know stealing stuff and shit like that. I actually wanted to make it out of the hood. So you know it gave me inspiration to keep going. And it's a very musical city, like Stax Records. You know, I grew up listening to a lot of artists from Stax. Like, Isaac Hayes, listen to a lot of stuff, uh, Soul Children, uh, Tim Priest, one of my favorite groups. So, you know, it just, it's overall, oh, the whole city is a musical city and a hustle city. You know, it, 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 they get down in the streets as well, but you gotta be strong when you're looking at these contracts. You can't let these executives run you over. So it's good that I'm from that city. I won't change anything, won't take anything back. No, I, I love that. And just, just speaking on like, growing up in that atmosphere and just, what made you want to go the music route to get out? 
Um, I've always wanted to be a um, musician. Okay. Like, you know, growing up, I was watching this TV show called Sha Na Na, and they used to sing and dance. I used to love that show. I fell in love with that show. And then later on in my life, you know, I fell in love with rap, like Sugar Hill Gang. And, but I was still listening to, you know, people like Prince and Michael Jackson, you know what I'm saying? I love their music. Um, so many uh, artists from the 80s, Luther Vandross, you can go for days, Stevie Wonder. So uh, just watching those guys play the piano and stuff like that, I wanted to be a singer at first. I wanted to play the piano and sing to the ladies. And you know, I ended up doing rapping because when I heard uh, Sugar Hill Gang, I was like, oh man, rapping, you know, I can do that. So uh, you know, I, I've always been that, had that producer type of mind. I, you know, I always wanted to do all kinds of music, not just rap, in which I'm, I've done it in my life. I've done pop music. I've done, I done everything. You know, I've rapped on uh, Latin music, everything. Wait, you can sing? I can't sing, but you know, I used to <laughs> want to be a singer. I might, oh. I might make a hold a note or two. I don't know. I was going to say, oh my goodness. I would do melodies. Not, not singing, but melodies. But I wanted to be. Like, I want, I wanted to be this, like, Barry White, you know what I'm saying? Isaac Hayes is sitting. Yeah, yeah. Well, not so much as with the deep voice, just like how they used to sit at the piano and play the piano and sing, you know? Prince did the same thing, too. I love that. Mm -hmm. So, um, I know uh, one of the topics you talk about in your book is the passing of Gangsta Boo. Yeah. She passed earlier this year. So, can you talk about, like, what her legacy and impact was in your own words, and like what it meant for her being a part of 3-6 Mafia. Man, she was that glow, you know what I'm saying? Gangsta Boo, uh, would, uh, we would be on stage and she would like, she was, while we performing, jumping around on stage, it wasn't all the shows, but a lot of the shows, she would sit down. So we up there rapping, and as soon as our part get ready to come on, she would step up, grab the mic, and start rapping our part, the whole club would go crazy. You know what I'm saying? She was out rapping us in the group. She had some gangsta gang, gang, boy, had some flows, man. You know what I'm saying? So can you like speak on like just like her impact and like what just her being a woman in that space out rapping all the men like really met during that time? I was amazed, man. You know what I'm saying? Because back then it was like gangsta boo. I would say the hottest rappers at that time was Lil Kim. Foxy Brown, uh, Gangsta Boo, you know, Trina. It wasn't like that many. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I feel like Gangsta Boo didn't get the recognition she posted to get, though, because uh, she ended up leaving 3 Six Mafia, so that really set her back. You know, if she would have stayed in the group, I feel like she would have been, like now, like, you know, like a legend like Nicki Minaj, you know what I'm saying? I feel like Gangsta Boo would have been right there. Cause she could, she was, she's a real lyricist. You also touch on, like, how people weren't happy for you guys when you got the Oscar, which was shocking to me because like, I remember being hyped mm -hmm. <laughs> when you guys won the Oscar, but like there were people within your space and I guess some peers that weren't as excited for you guys. Yeah, I was shocked. You know, I'm from Memphis, so I didn't know too much about Hollywood like that. You know, I've been there a few times and hung out and drank and smoked, but I, I didn't know, you know, that that type of atmosphere existed. I didn't know people was like that, you know. It wasn't everybody, but it was mostly everybody that was black, which was, was, was crazy. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, what's going on? And John Singleton walked up to me. He was like, yo, man, you feel that hate? You feel that hate? He said, yeah, they just mad because they ain't got one. And I was like, damn. I was really disappointed. I saw a lot of my favorite actors I actually grew up watching on TV. And I was like, damn. This shit, they was looking at me like, mm. fuck that nigga. You know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, wow. You know, they didn't say that, but they was looking like, rrr, rrr. it was like a lot of mugs, then a lot of, you know, saying, hey, you know, saying a lot of the white folks was like, hey, congratulations, Steven Spielberg, you know, John Travolta. I was just shocked. I, I was totally shocked. I was like, this is, but I was just, anyway, I was just like, whatever, man. But it's like, it's, it's still like a, such a huge and big moment. Yeah. I, I guess it's like hard for people, like to see people in a space they want to be in, instead mm -hmm. of like congratulating them on that, they, like, take it internally? Yeah, I think they overthink it, you know what I'm saying? I think they just over it. I don't think we should never overthink anything, you know what I'm saying? You should have confidence in yourself, whether you got a award or not, that, you know, you're happy, you should be happy. Like I said, that starts with mental health. Like I talk, a lot of people have so much mental issues within themselves. They feel like they have to get that statue to be that person, but you can be that person without that statue, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just have peace within yourself. And that's what 3 Mafia, we always had peace within when I said, we thought, you know, we was gonna lose, you know what I'm saying? We didn't even think we was gonna win. But you know, we weren't gonna cry. We was just gonna be like, we lost, we lost, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I got nominated for a Grammy. I lost, I lost. It wasn't even, I didn't get mad at nobody. If I saw somebody that won, even actually I met the dudes that actually beat me. 
and we did a song together. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm like, man, y'all dope. Because I listened to something, I was like, y'all dope. And I was like, man, shit, maybe we should do a song together. You know, why not? So, nah. man, you got to be happy with yourself. You know, you got to be like, I was, we was, we was thankful that we got nominated. You know, so we never been nominated for shit. So we was like, shit, we nominated? Wow. Then they asked us to perform. So I was like, man, I know they ain't gonna let us win, but damn, that's a lot of shit they showing love. You know what I'm saying? I was like, they really fucking with us like that, you know? No, like, that's like one of the few Oscar performances like I remember seeing growing up. Yeah. Like, cause it really was a moment. Yeah, it was legendary. Super legendary. Um, and then like, you talk about your uh, friendship with Mac Miller. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how did you like heal through that? Because like, I know that was like your, your boy. Man, I was just, I still cry today, man. Like, I still, man, it's, Terrible. I seen him. I was in the studio with him. Like, um, I can't exactly. I know it, it. It was. I can't say it was a month before that or two months. I can't remember exactly. But it was. I. It was close. But I remember being in the studio with him, and I was just like, I seen him doing drugs. And I was like, man. Look at that nigga. Like, what? The, wish I could have said something, you know? Because I had told Mac Miller before, it was back in the day when I first met Mac Miller, he was like 17, I thought it was 18th birthday party. I used to tell him all the time, I was like, man, you know what? You know, Hollywood is a, um, a cool place, but it's a crazy place, you know what I'm saying? I said, you know, you gotta be very careful out here and stay away from that cocaine. I used to tell him this in the beginning, you know? He went to the studio that I had uh, recommended him to, it was a friend of mine at the studio. And uh, he told me, he said, man, I went to that studio, man. That guy in there was crazy, man. I said, what, what happened? He said, I walked in and on his desk, it was a mountain high of cocaine. And I was like, damn, you know? And at that time, you know, I, I, you know, he, he, he talked like he was so shocked about it. So I know he wasn't doing drugs. I just said, man, whatever. I said, just stay away from it. And he didn't, he didn't really like the vibe when he seen the cocaine. So he left the studio. He, he didn't go back no more. And then I ended up finding out he was doing drugs, which I was shocked about. I was like, damn, I thought, you know, but I mean, I guess he just made a wrong turn, one wrong day or whatever, you know, it happens. And um, yeah, but the last time I saw him, you know, he had offered me cocaine and I told him, uh, you know, I'm good or whatever. And then he called me the next day. He's like, man, I'm sorry, man, I thought you did cocaine. I said, no, I told you, I just tell you. I know I, you know, rapped about a lot of different things with Reese's Mafia, but in my raps, you never hear me say, I, Juicy J snorted cocaine, you know what I'm saying? I might say, we gonna smash in the back of the bus and fill her nose up full of that dust, or something like that. Uh, but I was always representing somebody else, you know? I never was like, I'm doing the blow, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, we talked about it. It was nothing, whatever. That's my guy, I love him. And um, you know, months later, um, he was gone. The song you just referenced, have you seen it going viral on TikTok with the penguins? Yes. Have you done the dance? Yes, yes, I've done the dance, yeah. Really? Yeah. Me and Meg did the dance the other day in the studio. She ain't posted yet, but it's funny as hell. It took me a long She showed me how to do the dance. I didn't know how to do the dance. It's so fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, people love that song, man, you know? They love it. So, uh, so let's talk about, like, has there ever been an instance where you, like, stumbled upon, like, a unique sound or beat that just, like, turned into something? Like, it Stum could have been a sample or whatever. Yeah, just like, like, okay, um, I mean, we got three, six mafias, come on, we the sample kings, you know, <laughs> popping my collar, you know what I'm saying, stay fly, uh, international players, anthem, I mean, we can go for days, you know. But like, what was that moment where it's like, you just heard something, like, you were like, I don't know, and like, you chested it out, and it was like, no, this is, this is about to go. Um, I would say, um, our first record, I, I, I would say like, we call it our crossover record. It's a record called Good Stuff. It's a sample of this, uh, of an old school artist, o OG. I, think it was, I believe it was Johnny Taylor. Cause he had the song, of, give me some of that good love. So we changed the give me some of that good stuff. We talking about, co well, some people was talking about cocaine on the song. And some people was talking about weed, you know what I'm saying? But we just said good stuff. But overall, we was talking about drugs. Mm -hmm. But he was talking about good love. But uh, he, we cleared the sample. He, he, he actually liked the song. I don't think he knew what he was talking about, though. But that was our first song in Memphis. They actually played like heavy rotation on the radio, both stations, K97 and 107. And uh, that, that that gave us our name. That's when record labels started calling us like, oh, man, you know what I'm saying? After that, we got a, we did a major deal. I so yeah, it was that good stuff record. So you've been around and you've seen 
how the South hip hop scene has changed mm-hmm. over time. What would you say is like some major factors that transition to like putting the South like all the way up here and like changing like where it was when it first started down there? Um, I believe this the, the culture, the the um, the way we talk, the sauce we get. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it's like everybody wants to be like the South. They want to sound like the South. We got those, you know, send them beats that go like that. You know, everybody want that, man. You know, it it it, it moves you. Like our music moves. It always could turn the you know turn the club up and make niggas happy. And niggas could smoke weed to our shit and shit like that. And it's been going on forever. Once it started, it never stopped. It's actually getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So, so South got something to say. <laughs> and, um. Uh, before I forget, there's like the story in your book where you share about how one phone call like mm-hmm. saved you and Project Pat's life from yes. going a different route. So can you like shed light on that story? Yeah, it was this uh, this dude. You know, make sure you get that book, Chronicles of the Juice Man. I'm gonna tell you a little bit of the story. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give everything away. But anyway, uh, I got my car window shout out. This little coward ass nigga. You know what I'm saying? He was, you know, he tried to act like he was a bully and stuff like that. But I knew what type of dude he was. You know, he wasn't really. But I was the only person that stood up to the nigga, right? So he had shot my car one out. And then, uh, you know, he thought it was like, that was it. So we went we went quiet, but you know, we was quiet. And I, I was staying somewhere else, I was staked out somewhere else. And we had been staking out, my brother, we were staking out where he lived at. Well, see, we weren't gonna, yeah. we weren't gonna tell nobody and talk about it like everybody else, you know. You know we, actually, my brother rapped about some songs, but he didn't really reference the person's name but he referenced certain things, you know. He talked about he shooting up a nigga car. But we was we was gonna go get the nigga on the low though. He didn't even nobody knew. You know what I'm saying? We kept it on the low. And then um Pat was walking, he was he was masked up, ready to get him. And um he got a phone call from dude. And dude was like, oh man, I was on cocaine, I apologize, I was high, man, I love this. He was like a he was like a he was my friend. Like, you know, he was like my nigga, you know what I'm saying? He was a close friend. Like, I mean, this nigga was very close. He actually introduced Paul, man. You know, I didn't know Paul. He introduced me to Paul. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And um, Pat was finna go, they were finna go do him in. You know what I'm saying? Real shit. This is, this is a real story. It didn't happen, so, you know, <laughs> you know, thank God. You know what I'm saying? But because the guy called, Pat picked the phone up. Dude was a pot. I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. You know, I didn't mean to, man. I apologize. And Pat said he felt like that was God talking to him, man. You know what I'm saying? And um, he let it go. And I'm glad he did because if he didn't, we wouldn't be here today. You know, who knows how that shit would have turned out. You know, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad. It's a lot of things I, I, I did in life that I had to turn the other cheek. You know, some things I had to, took care of my business, sometimes I had to turn the other cheek. You know, and in, in Memphis, usually they don't really turn that cheek like that. Cheeks don't get, niggas, something go down, something just go down, you know what I mean? But, uh, you know, I was different. I was trying to, really trying to, um, I was trying to stay out as much as I could. You know, if I had to do what I had to do, like Malcolm X said, by any means necessary. You know what I mean? I did what I had to do. But I, I just thank God that um, a lot of those roads I didn't go down. And a lot of people with me, uh, I had to stop. You know, like Three Six Mafia. It's a lot of things they was about to do. You know, things we've done together, things they was about to do, I had to stop and intervene and stop that shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm glad it happened because, uh, like I say, it wouldn't be no Oscar, wouldn't be none of the success we have. You probably be locked up dead or in jail. Real shit. If you guys want to find out more about it, you gotta get the book. <laughs> yes. Get the book. So the segment we want to do is called Digging in the Crates. And we have a couple of mm-hmm. finals here. So I'm just pulling them out and you just talk about like whatever influence they had on you or like what you remember from like when they first job. And we're gonna kick it off really easy. Okay. With three six months. Oh yeah. <laughs> This one, live by your rep, man. The Bone situation. I love Bone, man. I am a fan of Bone, man. I wish we wouldn't even make that song. But we thought, you know, living in the South, you're in a small city. We don't, you don't really hear, you know, hey, we ain't been nowhere but Memphis and Mississippi. <laughs> we didn't go nowhere else. So, like, you hear somebody do a, like a style that kind of sound like yours, you'd be like, oh, man, he stole our style. You know what I'm saying? Off the rip and not even knowing that these people maybe never heard our stuff. You know, they just did what they did. Maybe that was just a wave of music. I mean, when you think about the music in the 50s and 60s, 70s, it all has a little similarity to it. Uh-huh. You know what I'm saying? You know, it may be a different different sauce, a different swag, whatever, but you'd be like, okay, this does sound like a little bit like 
James Brown, or like somebody took from this or this. So, or or in or in the same wave, maybe in the same um, the same wave of music, you know, even same artists like maybe somebody had a Stevie Wonder vibe, and you know, it could Stevie Wonder, then somebody had a Stevie Wonder vibe, whatever, you know. It could have been like another person. Ray Charles could have been upset with Stevie Wonder because they probably, he probably like, oh man, you doing kind of what I'm, you know, who knows? And they, you know, they kind of like somewhat the same, not talking about Costa Blind, nothing like that, but it's like they both played piano and they wrote songs. But anyway, um, what I'm saying is, I'm getting at, we was like, oh man, they still in our song. We were bone thugs. We were like, oh, they still in our music anyway. So we make this Three Six Mafia Bone Disc record, and, um, you know, we had a lot of fun making the songs on that. We uh, did a little EP. I remember a lot of stuff on here, man. Uh, we had a Chop the Screw record on here, you know what I'm saying? We had a, like, a fun time. It was a really good EP. But I'm, I'm glad that we um, met with them at the airport and we seen them. It wasn't even nothing, man. You know, they're good people, man. You know what I'm saying? I'm a fan of Bone. And uh, hopefully we can do a, a tour or something, man. I think it'd be dope. That would be fire. Yeah. All right, next one. It's Oh, yeah. That's the one with the old wanna be is a soldier, a soldier. Is that on there? Let's see. That one, soldier. All I wanna be. Yep, and Briz yeah. got a baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. What I liked about Tupac, man, he was so thugged out, but he was talking that real shit. What are you speaking about? Brenda's got a baby. Like real like stuff that niggas don't even talk about. You know what I'm saying? Um, what's the other one? A soldier. All I wanted to be was a soldier. A soldier. You know, niggas growing up in the hood going through uh, a lot of trauma and a lot of uh, just, just devastating situations. They they feel like soldiers. And I also had this group of niggas in Memphis that was called Soldiers from the North Side. And just like niggas I would just retain, you know what I mean? For action. And we called them Soldiers from the North Side. I had I used to put it in my song, Soldiers from the North Side, ready to stump a cap a trick, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love that's a classic album. Keeping on with the classics. Wow. <laughs> a lot of weed smoke. A lot of weed smoke. Um, I mean, everything on that album, man. I was, we was just talking about that. Um, uh, it's this song that called High Powered. We was talking about that today. One of my favorite songs uh, with RBX on that album, man. Well produced, well, well put together. Classic. How influential was this, like, on your own production style? Oh, yeah, this really... Man, I was when I listened to this, I was I was trying to do all kind of shit. I was like, Dr. Dre is the best producer in the world, man. Let me, we gotta step out of game, but man, I'm I'm trying all kind of shit, man. You know, I'm we was working with live instruments and all kind of shit, uh, opera singers, all shit. You know what I'm saying? Just 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 off the inspiration of Dr. Dre, cause Dr. Dre he, he always stepped his game up on his on his uh, production. Even when he left NWA, he did great. Then we went solo, it was even better. I was like, oh shit, niggas ain't stopping. All of them was talented, man. I know, like, quick question, because you said, like, you guys uh, would try, like, live bands and singers. Do people, do producers still do that? Cause I know that was, like, big back in the, like, Motown days. Like, mm -hmm. you had the bands come in before it. Do you see producers still, like, use that, or? No. 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 Is that, like, a missing element that should be brought back in? Um, I mean, it, it, I say to each his own, you know. I mean, that's, I, I, I do, the way me and Paul may be, you know, I can't tell you all the secrets, man. We had, we made our own kicks. We made our own snares. I can't tell you how we did that. But we, we did some crazy shit, you know what I mean? Like, people would come in the studio, it'd be, it'd be mic'd up, you know. They would have sex in the booth. A guy and his girlfriend would have sex in the booth. We'd mic the whole booth up and use that as, like... So he sounds for real. <laughs> yeah, we would use that in the song, you know what I'm saying? It was, it was turned up in the, in the studio. You know, we was very creative with our stuff. Next one. Okay. Yeah, man. You and I, Aquamina. What I liked about this album, um, it shows the, vers the versatile, you know, uh, Andre 3000. I mean, him and Big Boy was just like, they was totally two different vibes, you know what I'm saying? Big Boy, he the player, you know what I'm saying? Andre 3000, he's mystical, mysterious. It's perfect, you know what I'm saying? Like, you hear some songs, all of them, like they songs, all the songs like sound different. So what do you think set groups like Outkast, 3 Six Mafia, and UGK, like groups and, and duos in the South apart from like other groups in like the North and the West? Oh, we had our own sauce. And, like Outkast didn't sound nothing like 3 Six Mafia. You know, back in our day, you know, it was like, like the 90s, nobody sounded like nobody. Mm -hmm. You know, not, not like today, you know, a lot of people sound alike. 
Back then, nobody wanted to sound like nobody. Somebody said, man, you sound like such and such. They'd be like, oh, fuck that. I got to change my, ver my verse. <laughs> nobody wanted to, everybody wanted to have their own style, their own vibe, their own wave. You know what I'm saying? That's what I liked about back in the day. So that's what makes everybody, you know, unique. And it's just stand out. Just stand out on their own. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Going into another group. Continue. Wu-Tang Clan. Classics, man. Classics. I'm talking classics. Come on. What about? Cash Rules. Very inspirational. Come on now, this, 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 this album was like that New York Street shit. You know what I'm saying? Choo choo, blah. You know what I'm saying? New, I, I love the way uh, the sauce of Wu Tang. You know what I'm saying? They, I felt like they would go in the studio and they would spit that real street shit. And I, to me, I was like, man, they didn't go back there and try to redo that shit. Like if O Dirty messed up or something, you hit a slur in his word, he would leave it like that. But that shit would sound hard though. It was very raw. You know what I'm saying? Authentically raw. Yeah. Then we got Tribe. Man, great vibes. Tribe Called Quest, Q-Tip. They always had those good weed smoking, hippie, you know, I'm, I'm in a happy place vibes, man. We gotta bring that kind of music back, you know what I'm saying? They do. Yeah. It always made me feel good. Well, how do you feel about the music now? Like, does it like not make you feel as good or? Yeah, yeah. It still I, does? I, 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 it, like it's a different time, you know, that was in the 90s. This is 2023, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I love everything, man. Look, I, I got songs with some of everybody. Like, I love everything that's out, all the new stuff. You know, I respect it, you know? I'm a fan of, of a lot of these rappers. You name them, I'm, I'm listening. Yeet, Playboy Cardi, you know, Pierre Bourne. This, we gonna keep going, little baby. I love them all. They dope. Money bag, yo. Yeah, man. Glorilla, all these artists, man. They dope. College dropout. Yes. Kanye West, man. Um, Kanye West is a genius. When he came out, a lot of people doubted him because he wasn't on that street shit. You know what I'm saying? He was on some real life shit, some uplifting shit. You know what I'm saying? And just speaking his mind. And what I liked about him, he was just different. He, he just did what he did. I always, I always respect artists that just do what they do, you know. I see some artists be trying to be like this, trying to be like that person, you know, in my day. Or try to dress like this person. But I love artists to be like, nah, I'm just gonna just wear what I wear. Like, look at me, I'm in a straight jacket. I don't give a, you know what I mean? This is me, this is Juicy J, you know, I, I just do me. I love artists, and one thing I'm about, I love about Kanye West, like I say, he just, he just do him, man, you know what I'm saying? Authentically. And didn't care. What nobody said. Now we got Omatic. Classic, man. Like Nas is uh, one of my favorite artists, man. Like I, I would love listening, but even before I made music, I would listen to Nas, man. Nas would have that street uplifting shit. I love rappers that, um, that talk about something in a song. You know, it's really talking about a message. You know, I can learn something from it after. I'd be like, oh yeah, he said this, he said that, or whatever and had me thinking, instead of just me like, oh, that was cool. Like, all the Nas music had you, had you thinking, you know what I'm saying? Dope ass MC, you know what I'm saying? One of the, I, I'll call him the greatest. I call, I give him Nas at number one, you know? With Nas being like one of your favorite rappers, when you got the chance to meet him in person, like, what was that like for you? Yeah, yeah, man, I fanned out. I was like, man, this nigga, man, I grew up on your shit. <laughs> for real, man, like, you know, like, I'm, I got, man, I faithfully got all the Nas albums, man. No, that was hard, man. I, I love that. I love when um, people that are famous are fans of other people that are famous, and they yeah. actually get to meet them and like share how influential they are to them. Yeah. They last so. Man, potholes in my lungs. I love they last so, man. And our last one, Shad Compton. You know, I forgot the name some NWA shit too. Cause this was early nights too. That I, I actually I might take somebody off, but uh, that's 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 one of my one of my albums though. But uh, yeah, that's that was like the album. That's got that fuck the police on there, straight out of Compton. Man, that shit right there, super classic. What I liked about that album, I loved the. It was like in a circle, and Easy got the gun point down. Like they about to, you know what I'm saying? They got the dude laid out. He about to get murdered, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> They didn't give a fuck, man. You know, Easy E and uh, NWA, that was the first people that was rapping about gangster shit. What was one of like, the first artists or groups you like really related to? First group, I would say was Sugar Hill Gang. That was a group. 
that's you know what you that's, 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 that's the first, yeah, that's the first rap song I fell in love with. Okay. And then later on, I would say Ron DMC and then Beastie Boys and um, EPMD and, you know, the list goes on. But looking back over your entire career, mm -hmm. uh, what's one highlight that stays with you always? Uh, I remember when we went down to Atlanta. We was passing out CDs. We even met Jermaine Dupree. We gave him a CD. We didn't, no, we didn't get no response or nothing like that. He, we, we ran into him. We talked about it. He said, I remember you niggas came up to me. Uh, just, just there were those legendary moments. And then we was trying to get known and whatever, and then we left. And then we got a call, and somebody was like, man, y'all blowing up down here, man. Tell the club up. It's like the hottest song in Atlanta. I was like, what? So we, then we went down to Atlanta. And um, some people, in, like Coops and Nigga Paul, they had perms. So we walked up on, we was walking through the uh, the driveway, and then we were walking through the line. They were like, all right, let the group in. And niggas was like looking at us, and somebody was like, who are these niggas? I heard somebody say, who are these niggas? Easy E? The nigga think he's Easy E or something? Because they had, we had perms. Well they, well, they had perms. I didn't have a perm. They had a perm. Paul had a perm. Coops and Nigga had a perm. I think Lord of us had something that looked like a perm. <laughs> it was just like, it was funny. You know, I was like, oh, nigga, call, nigga, call Coops and Nigga, Uzi, Easy E. So we laughed and whatever. But I didn't know what to expect. You know, the, the DJ was telling the, tell the club was our song, so we rapping songs from Mystic Styles. People were just kind of jamming a little bit. And then we did Tell the Club Up, the whole club went crazy. I mean, like, it exploded. I was like, I had to stop with I was like, damn, this is, this, you know what I'm saying? I was like, this is amazing, you know what I'm saying? I was like amazed by that shit. And after, after that, we blew up. Well, thank you for talking with us today. Thank Before you. we go, do you have any final words? Go buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Chronicles of the Juice Man. You will get the audio book on Apple, Spotify, or Barnes & Noble, Amazon, or your nearest bookstore. <laughs>